talk about the Mennonites and Amish today. Mennonites believe in the sinner's prayer. They believe that an individual must accept the atonement that Jesus offered, the blood sacrifice, in order for them to be able to go to heaven. And they believe that those that are outside of their religion, that are either skeptical or maybe never heard the message, will be denied paradise, that they will go to hell. Many of them believe that they will go into eternal torment. I applied for an Indiana Art Commission grant to do the Pop Mennonite series, and when I got it, um, I had already been out of the Mennonite denomination for a while. I went back to Delaware and found as many cassette tapes as possible of Mennonite preaching. I took almost all my dad's bulletins he had been collecting, and I resubmersed myself in the Mennonite denominations. I was living in Indiana, my childhood church in Sussex County is 12 hours away. Between um, reading and listening to those tapes, it helped kind of put me back in that space, kind of as an anthropologist, but also the, the series is kind of playful, like I'm juxtaposing pop culture with sacred culture, and so that was kind of the goal. <laughs> I listened to those cassettes, some of them were so old that as I put them in a cassette player, they fragmented and fell apart. I copied things, it's where the Pop Mennonite soundtrack that's played at the exhibits was created from. Getting some distance helped make the art better. I did a talk at a Mennonite church in Chicago and they asked me, did creating the art give me a a stronger belief towards the Mennonites being kind of right or wrong, and I don't think it did. Like, I see <laughs> all denominations as having their issues. There's some beautiful things about the Amish and Mennonites, and of course there's problems. The journey was maybe more personal than if another artist had made it because of my father's excommunication. Maybe it made it a little more painful to revisit some of these things. And I actually reached out to the bishop of the time period. Well, good evening. Just wanted to open dialogue with him, and he was very affable and actually reached out for wanting kind of forgiveness for me as a child that I went through, all, you know, I went through some of this and didn't really know what to do with it. And they, as pastors, didn't know quite how much they needed to be ministering to me as a young man that my father was excommunicated and how that would affect me. So that was, was kind of beautiful. It was a beautiful moment. I wanted the paintings to be playful. So they have a kind of a American regionalist feel. That's where my heart was with the style and the drawings. I wanted them to complement the paintings and still have that kind of pop feel. So what do Mennonites think of art? I, as a kind of gross overstatement, art in church is a distraction. Art at home is frivolous. If you get a free calendar from the seed company that has beautiful farms and landscapes, that could go on your wall. If a child or an aunt, grandmother, someone painted a watercolor and it was free, that could go on the wall. But to invest money in art, to purchase art, was typically not done. It was conspicuous consumption. What is a Mennonite? How would you answer that? Methodist, Baptist, Nazarene, Presbyterian, Catholic, Church of God, Church of Christ, and Mennonite. And then there's all the community churches, independents. Where do these names come from? The church next door to where I live, it's a small church, New Beginnings Holiness Ministries. Well, I'm going to be preaching a sermon against the Mennonite Amish religion. And so... 
the verse there is at the beginning of Romans chapter 12 where it talks about in chapter 2 and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind one of the mottos kind of of the Mennonite Amish religion is not being conformed to this world we have a, a lady in our church that came out of the Mennonite religion the blood of Jesus Christ made the difference for all of us and without the blood we were all lost and without hope in this world do we get that do we spend the time to let that sink in that we were without hope without Christ and because of the blood of the cross we can be here today you know when someone says they're Mennonite or someone says they're Amish what does that even mean basically the Amish and Mennonites are sort of like cousins the Amish branched off from the Mennonites okay now the Mennonites are known to be extremely conservative people in fact where I grew up especially as my parents moved to Pennsylvania it's very common to see women wearing bonnets on their hair everywhere they go because they believe in head coverings they're very conservative the Mennonites you know, came out of Anabaptist origins, and then the Amish came out of the Mennonites. Okay. People get those confused. They think the Amish are the Mennonites because the, the Amish is like a crazy version of the Mennonites, like the hardcore, you can't shave, no electricity, et cetera, et cetera. It's really common in the U.S. It's actually, it's the fastest growing religion in the world, actually, by percentage. Because they have a lot of kids, you know, and, and so everyone stays in the religion. But no electricity because electricity is of the devil. That's why Christ built the church. So we can be an example to the world what it looks like to get along and be in unity together. Mennonite Anabaptists in 1693, led by Jacob Ammon. You're dealing with the 1800s here. The Amish divided into Old Order Amish and Amish Mennonites. Okay. So now you have Mennonites, old, old Order Amish, and Amish Mennonites, okay? And it says, uh, the latter do not eschew uh, motor cars, whereas the Old Order Amish retain much of their traditional culture. When people refer to the Amish today, they normally refer to the Old Order Amish. But that's the thing, like Mennonite could be horse and buggy. But if you're talking about the schism of the Amish, when you're dealing with Amish, there's a whole spectrum there too, right? You have the old order Amish that are like horse and buggy, and then you have the the Amish Mennonites, which is more, you know, like they'll drive a car and stuff like this. And then the Mennonites, you have all the way to horse and buggy, and then you have that. So it's not as clear cut to be like, well, Mennonite means they're a little more modern. Amish means that they're more traditional. Look, there's a lot of nice things about the Mennonites. They're, they're, they're family oriented, they're conservative, they are very friendly and nice people, but they still have the wrong religion, and they're still gonna die and go to hell unless they believe on Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because they're hearing a work salvation message at their churches. They preach and believe a work salvation, and there is no persecution for them anywhere in the world. Jesus said that on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake. He says, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. This sermon is not going to be all about their salvation message, but it is false, meaning that they believe in a works-based salvation. Looking at these words of Jesus and saying, what if he like meant those things? I mean, you know, I thought of my salvation just as sort of a sinner's prayer, but now suddenly if the word was to become a blueprint for me, a model for me, then that changed my life. And the big problem with the Mennonites here today is they don't believe the right gospel. They believe you can lose your salvation. Um, help us to um, look to you as, as the author and finisher of our faith. So what does this have to do with faith? The faith that comes in like a flood. What does it have to do with the righteousness through faith, which the Apostle Paul is talking about there in his testimony in Philippians 3? What does it have to do with the future of Greenwood? If you are young and still live at home, join your parents. If you anticipate having a household in the future, commit that to God. But let's do it together for ourselves personally, for our families, with our friends, for Greenwood Mennonite Church as we enter this second century. A great family of brothers and sisters, both here scattered around the globe, in all their cases, as far as why they do certain things, they usually have a verse here or there that they're using. But what I see with the Amish and the Mennonites is they're, they're basically taking doubtful disput disputations or things that you should be fully persuaded in your own mind as far as what's right and wrong. You know, a lot of gray area issues like dress standards and taking that to being this is doctrine and you're not right with God if you don't do it the way we do it. 
But as Christians, we want to stay under God's umbrella of protection. We need to believe it is God's way and his government and follow his headship. When it comes to the Mennonites and the Amish, I can go into a lot of different things that they teach that are wrong and all that. But really what it comes down to is that they're focusing in on little things and taking them way too far. And they're omitting the primary things that they're supposed to be doing. The Lord is risen. He is risen Amen. So the idea of just like isolating yourself is so unbiblical. It starts with our sin. To say, well, we're just trying to do what, you know, God wants us to do, and we're trying to live like, no, you need to go into the highways and hedges. You need to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A leader is somebody who is walking upstream against the tide. Are we doing that with the tide of the world um, coming in against us? Are you willing to stand up against the tide and not be a part of the kingdom of the world in our lifestyle, in our words, in our entertainment, in our music? How are you going to do that? if you're cutting yourselves off from society. And listen, I'm all for you not being of the world and you know, not loving this world and not loving the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, you know, all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not against you in that. I think all five of these together form sort of a beautiful description of the general attitude of the believer. And that, of course, is, is love. That the Reformation kind of spread from the top down. Remember, even when the peasants revolted, what was Luther's response? All right, they're getting it, or kill them. Suffering for doing what is right. And that's the theme there in verses 13 to 17. Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Why, if the Mennonites are the true Anabaptists, why was there no persecution for the Mennonites today? 2 Timothy 3, verse 11, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will of godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. They have no persecution anywhere in the world. Don't tell me that they're the ones that are the Anabaptists 500 years ago. Eventually, you, as the, the light of the world, are going to be challenged for that very thing. People love darkness, the Bible tells us. People like to hide in obscurity. And when you as a Christian shine the light on a person's need, on a person's wrongdoing, on their wrong behavior, it can turn you into an enemy. What is the cross? What, is it? what was it for Jesus? What is it for us? In 1 John chapter 3, Verse 14, he says, By this we know that we have passed from death unto life when we love our brothers. Some days we all dream of living a simpler life. Amen? No, not really, though. I, I, I actually like all the, the, the technology. But no, sometimes I, there's a side of me, there's a part of me that longs for a simpler life. But I was raised in the city, so I don't think I could ever go that route. But folks, if they just wanted to live out in the countryside and, you know, exempt from Social Security, sounds great, you know, go out, do a lot of physical labor, it's a healthy life, living off the land, traditional, family values, it all sounds great, folks, but that's not what it is. It's a religion, it's a false religion that is against the Bible. That's the problem, okay? Help us, God, to be a light um, in the world around us and be willing to do that with a Good spirit, not grudgingly, but do it in a way that would bring honor to you. To just shun yourself from using that technology just because you're afraid that you're going to get into wickedness, you're missing out on opportunities to reach the world. That it's possible that he is talking about criticism that comes from within the group, not necessarily from without. And um, I think that's a challenge that all of us at different stages or times in our life deal with. If you think, well, this group 500 years ago are brethren in the faith, first ask yourself, did they go through any persecution? And by the way, this is why we know the Mennonites are not the Anabaptists and are not the same faith. You say, why? Because they have no persecution worldwide. None. Look, if you have no persecution for being a Mennonite worldwide anywhere, it's because, you know what, you're not the true religion. They claim they're the Anabaptists. Why don't they ever go through persecution? Jesus said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
In John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if, finish it. Verily, verily, says Jesus, verily, verily, I say unto you. The Mennonites trace their origins particularly to the so-called Swiss Brethren, an Anabaptist group that formed near Zurich, Switzerland in 1525. In the face of imminent persecution for the rejection of the demands of the Zurich reformer Huldrych Swingley. In 1536, Mena rejected the Catholic Church and its teachings. He would garner a gathering of followers and those that were his, believed his teachings and followings became known as Mennonites. Mennonites, however, like many other denominations, have had many schisms or divisions over the years. The Mennonites split into the Waterlanders, High Germans, Flemish, the, the Friesians, and then splitting of different groups and coming back together again. Our own path on this chart would take us through the schism led by Jacob Amon, which we started as Mennonites, and we went to the Amish, the followings of Jacob Amon. He was a strong proponent of shunning a practice they used to enforce church rules with the intent to remind the wayward of their sin. And so they split off from the Mennonites. There was another schism in the early 1900s where a group split off from the Amish, and they were known as the Amish Mennonites. It's kind of a division, and some felt like that those Amish Mennonites were taking too many liberties, and so they became known as the conservative Amish Mennonites. And guess who they were? Our cornerstone that was on our old building. If you look on it, it says C A M Mennonite, meaning conservative Amish Mennonite. That was the beginning of our conference. We now are part of a conference of Mennonite churches known as Rosedale Network of Churches, a global family of Anabaptists. Harold S. Bender in the 1940s and 50s was a, uh, a, a real brainy guy who, who was, did some great research in, in Mennonite history and started the Mennonite Quarterly Review and all that side of thing and, and helped uh, Mennonite scholarship like never before. But he really made it where if you weren't a Swiss brother and you weren't an Anabaptist, I mean, no way around it. And I mean, he had some good points. All the other groups faded away and became nothing. All the different extreme things just faded away. But later on, when people stopped being conservative Mennonites, they said, hey, aren't I still an Anabaptist? And so the trend then came into the, to the 60s and the 70s of bringing up all these different fringe groups and saying, well, they're Anabaptists, and so we're kind of like those people. That's why we're doing these strange things, because those people did. And all this arguing on who can be an Anabaptist and who can't be an Anabaptist is a bit academic. But for your purposes, understand that Harold S. Bender went too far with his explanation of saying, if you're not a Swiss brother and you're not an Anabaptist. I think in understanding who we are as Mennonites, it's also helpful to know who is an Anabaptist. If you go all the way back in history to 1517, there was a major division in church history. It's a time period known as the Reformation. One of those persons was a man by the name of Martin Luther who brazenly nailed his 95 theses on the church door of the Wittenberg Castle. In these theses, Luther claimed that the repentance required by Christ in order for sins to be forgiven involves inner spiritual repentance rather than merely external sacramental confession. He vehemently opposed the sale of indulgences, which was the practice of the church at that time. It was the action of clergy receiving money in return for absolving one's sins. Pretty good source of revenue, too. I'll be sitting in the room over there after church with the basket. <laughs> you can bring your money. He refused to recant, and he said unless his mistakes were pointed out to him by appeals to Scripture and right reason, he would not. In fact, he could not recant. And his refusal set in motion his ultimate excommunication from the church. Other persons began to emerge at that time who began to read and interpret the Bible and understand what it meant and said for themselves which also put them in opposition to the teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. Ulrich Zwingli was another of those persons. He began to preach systematically through the New Testament, which was a radical departure from the Catholic Mass at that time. And then there were other young priests who sat under his teaching, and they became even more radical than Zwingli, and 
their opposition insisted following only that which had biblical support. Imagine that. They rejected mass and infant baptism, among other things. And one night after a secret prayer meeting, George Blara, Conrad Greville, and Felix Mons, and others who were there baptized each other upon confession of faith in Christ. And this created serious issues for these reformers because of the relationship of the church and state, where there was a connection there where the church actually did some pretty terrible things in that time. Many lost their lives as a result of these newfound beliefs. One of these men, in 1526, the Zurich Council had passed an edict that made adult rebaptism punishable by drowning. In 1527, Felix Mons became the first casualty of that edict. He was taken to the Lamont River. His hands were tied together, his feet were tied together. They pulled his hands down by his knees, stuck a rod through between his elbows and knees chunked him in the river and drowned. There were numerous teachings and practices of the Anabaptists, and five key doctrines emerged from the teachings of these early leaders. Sola is the Latin word for only. And when you look back in the history of the church, there are key pieces of what shaped doctrines and teachings of the Anabaptists and the Mennonites. The first was sola scriptura, scripture alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Solo Christo, Christ alone. Solo Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Solo Fides, faith alone, emphasizes salvation as a free gift. The Roman Catholic Church of the time emphasized the use of indulgences, giving money to buy status with God. Gratia, grace alone, emphasizes grace as a reason for our salvation. In other words, salvation comes from what God has done rather than what we do. Reformers emphasize Jesus as the high priest who intercedes on our behalf. And solo de gloria for, to the glory of God alone. Emphasis the glory of God as the goal of life rather than striving to please church leaders. Keeping a list of rules or guarding our own, own interests. Our goal is to glorify the Lord. Our culture has a very consumeristic attitude. It's all about me. If I do what God wants me to do, then I should expect, expect blessing from him. It's about my happiness and it's about my success. Nowhere in Scripture they felt they could find anything about baptizing an infant. And they began baptizing people on that basis, and they became known as rebaptizers, which is where we get the name Anabaptist. Anna means again. For that belief and practice, many lost their life. Another disagreement was over the Lord's Supper. The church believed and taught that the bread and cup literally became the body of Jesus. The reformers said, no, the Bible teaches that these symbols are symbols that we take to remember his broken body and his shed blood. One of these reformers, which we get our name as Menace Simons, he was a Roman Catholic priest. He also was excommunicated from the church for his beliefs. He became an influential leader in the Anabaptist movement. He said he had never read the Bible either before or during his training for the priesthood to the Catholic Church, out of fear that he would be adversely influenced by that. Imagine that. Think you're influenced by reading the Bible? Probably. Gradually, as he sat under the teaching of those in the Anabaptist movement from his own study and understanding, the Bible became his source of authority, not the Catholic Church. However, he was troubled as he watched some in the Anabaptist movement transform a part of the peaceful biblical each citizen was expected to help Christ usher in the millennium whether it took force or whatever and he saw those people as having accepted some very unchristian principles and practices as Menon's dedication to teaching the Bible and his leadership became known the number of people that opposed him increased so much so that his life became endangered, so he quietly renounced all worldly reputation, name and fame, infant baptism, easy life, and willingly submitted to stress and poverty under the heavy cross of Christ. It was no easy life, living and moving. He feared for his family, moving from one place to another, simply because his belief that he felt came from the Bible. At one point, money was offered by authorities for his apprehension. We get our name from this man, but we also get his teachings on taking up the cross of Jesus. 
the significant impact that that had on the, on the church. From the very earliest of days of the Reformation until today, people have had differing opinions on interpreting the Bible. The Nicene Creed was first adopted by the First Council of Nicaea in 325, long before the Reformation. It was written in response to the teaching of a church elder by the name of Arius who began publicly proclaiming his theory that Jesus was not God at all, only a celestial servant of the true most high gods. The Schleitheim Confession of Faith in 1527, there were seven articles, several of them dealing with baptism, church discipline, separation from the world, and the use of sword. There was the Dordrecht Confession of Faith, a statement of religious beliefs adopted by the Dutch Mennonite leaders at the meeting in Dordrecht in the Netherlands in 1632. There were statements on God the Creator, the fall of man, the restoration of man. We believe and confess that since the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth and therefore prone to all unrighteousness, sin, and wickedness, the first lesson of the precious New Testament of the Son of God is repentance and reformation of life. The Mennonite Confession of Faith, which was written in 1963, and a lot of that is still probably nearly the same, although there are some differences since then. And in our own conference, there was written a statement of theology, which was adopted by our conference in 1991, a statement of practice adopted in 2007. And you can find those statements, and I encourage you to, to get them and read them, because their statements is... They kind of say, this is what we believe. There have been other statements written in regard to certain situations and, and things that come up in our culture. There's a statement on abortion, sexuality. Those are things that were maybe were not confronted by them, although if you read in the Bible, you'll see that these issues really aren't very new. As you think of the question of what is a Mennonite, it is, by the way, an important question. Names often give people an idea of who we are and what we believe. If I say Amish to you, what do you immediately think of? Horse and buggy. There's other people, when they think of Mennonite, they have certain things they think of. There's a lot of different Mennonites. How many of you have come here this morning that had a black bumper on your, on your car? I don't know if there's anybody out there or not, but there's some churches that... My son lives in Ohio, and as I ride to his place, if I go by the church on a Sunday morning, the cars are all black. It identifies them. I think the bigger question that we need to ask is how should a follower of Jesus conduct his life? While Mennonite kind of tells some things about us, in reality, there's some areas I'd probably be, prefer not to be known as Mennonite because there's some of the teachings and things and practices that some places, Mennonite churches, are now doing that I don't feel are biblical at all. And so to be known as Mennonite there, I wouldn't prefer that. And that was some of the motivation behind changing the name of our conference. This church has supported us for a lot of years. Um, yeah, at least 37, 38 years ago, uh, we left and kind of come back off and on for a sabbatical or so, but uh, pretty much have been gone from this community. And over the years, ah, boy, this church has, has sent youth groups and the salt shakers and work crews. And I don't know, it has just really blessed us. And so thank you. Some of you uh, here uh, probably don't know me, and I see that that's a really good sign. It means that the church is growing, it's changing. That's a sign of life when um, new people are coming in. And, um, and so I just bless you. And um, I think, yeah, you probably know I'm Richard and Sheldon's uh, brother and Violet's son, uh, for those of you who are, are new, new here. I think my four minutes are up, and I haven't heard anyone ring a bell, but I suppose that's it. <laughs>